What is up, y'all? Welcome back to our Fish the Moment live stream. Today, Randy and I are going to be answering your questions that we got on Facebook, Instagram, our Patreon page, all over the place. And hopefully you guys are going to learn something about bass fishing tonight. See, a bunch of guys are already on the stream. We got Joseph, Dustin, Keith, Kevin, Ernest, Mike, Timo. How's everyone doing tonight? Randy, how are you doing tonight? Been good, man. Just uh, we've had four days in a row of the of the fish the moment on the water lessons, and it has been like twenty to twenty five degrees for four days in a row. So it was nice to uh, to to sort of warm up today. I've been I've been like an ice cube for four days in a row, man. Man, that's tough. And I know going out in the cold, like I, I know about like in the summer, it can be tough. But something about just freezing all morning line freezing up in your guides it just takes the energy out of you it wipes me out for sure yeah it'll wear you out i mean the, co the cold weather will sap your energy you know quicker than anything i mean because your body has to work that much harder to keep warm plus you got the wind chill of running across the lake because in the morning when we took off it'd be like 24 25 degrees so if, even if you're running 30 miles an hour your wind chills in the single digit so um it's yeah it's it's a it's a challenge a little bit fish have been biting pretty good though yeah, you've been kind of getting on them. I'm excited, actually. We're going to go out next week to Table Rock. Randy's going to show me how to, to uh, catch some jerk bait fish. He's, I'm going to make him spill all of his secrets, guys, in that video. We're going to throw him up the drone, doing a hardcore fish the moment video with Randy. So excited to uh, share that with you guys. Let me know, too, on the stream if you can see both Randy and myself on my streaming software for the reason. It looks a little bit cut off. So just let me know if you can see Randy and myself over in the live chat. Um, that'd be very helpful. And other than that, Randy, let's just jump right into it. Got a bunch of questions you want to answer. We don't want to waste a lot of time. So starting off, let's start with our first question, which is from Keith uh, Froud from our Facebook community page. If you haven't gone to our Facebook community page, guys, it's just the Fish the Moment community, and you can just head there, and we post a question or a post on Facebook, Instagram, all of our social media platforms where you can actually submit questions for the live stream. So um, just check those out if you want to submit your questions. And this question is a really good one. It's actually the title of the stream, and it's, if you could only use five baits all year round, what baits would you choose, and what are the best colors for both clear and murky water? Also, what trailer would you choose? He's trying to simplify um, what he's doing. He says there's just too many options out there. So I want to kind of give my opinion, and I kind of, I'm going to frame it a little bit differently. Randy, if we could have five baits to fish for the rest of our life, literally we couldn't get any other baits for the rest of our life, what would you, what would you pick? And so I have my five. I know you have your five as well. So I'll start us out here. And my baits obviously are going to be a little bit more skewed towards the offshore fishing uh, side just because that's what I like to do. So number one, it's not going to be a surprise to you guys by any means. It's going to be the Fish the Moment Offshore Jig. Probably pretty predictable. I designed this lure for Jewel. Uh, it's 5 8 sounds football jig. Great for, through brush piles. If you checked out my recent video, I caught a 7, a 6, a 5, and a 4 on the same day, on the same lake, uh, with this jig. So definitely check out this jig if you want to catch some offshore fish. It works for me year-round. I did a video about the Big Bass Index. Um, where this is my best bait throughout the entire year, especially in the winter and in the summer. So great bait. Um, you can buy two for five or two for six ninety nine off Jewel's website here. They're only available on jewelbait.com, but check those out. For my trailer, I like to go with a striking rage craw. I throw a menace grub, I throw a big salty chunk, I throw a bunch of different trailers, but in general, if I just had to pick one trailer year round it would be just a green pumpkin strike king rage craw um, you can again go to a bunch of different trailers but this is the situation where we can only pick one bait uh in each or you know pick five baits for the rest of our life so i'd be throwing a striking rage craw green pumpkin color and i'd probably just go with a peanut butter and jelly uh fish mm -hmm. offshore jig peanut butter and jelly is a great color dirty and clear water now uh second bait that i'd be throwing is another offshore bait, which is going to be a Strike King 6XD deep diving crankbait. I can catch fish on a deep diving crankbait, again, year-round, and my go-to color is going to be a powder blue back sartreuse. It's great in dirty water, great in clear water. Honestly, they bite a yellow and blue back bait 
in any water visibility, especially if you have some cloud cover and some wind. So honestly, I would just go with this one color. If I could go, you know, a clear water color as well, then I would probably go over here and pick up the green gizzard shad, another great color for a little bit clearer water. That 6XD is an awesome bait when those fish are really aggressive offshore and they're pulled up anywhere from, you know, 10, maybe even 8 to like, you know, 18 feet of water. I hammer them on this bait. So couldn't live without 6XD, couldn't live without the football jig. The next bait would be a Mega Bass Spark Shad in the 3 inch size. If I had the option, I would pick all the sizes because the Spark Shad's awesome. But if I had to pick one bait year round of this uh, bait, it would be the 3 inch Mega Bass Spark Shad in the albino color. If I was fishing in clear water, if I was fishing in a little more stained water, I would go to this uh, more pearl color. And the great thing about this Mega Bass Spark Shad is that you can throw it in multiple ways. I would be throwing it first on a little swim bait head, the 4x4 little head swim bait head. This is just a little jig head. And I would assume I could use all different sizes. So I go from an eighth ounce to a three eighths ounce size. And I'd also throw it on a uh, Alabama rig. So assuming I could also throw these swim baits on Alabama rig, different riggings, I would have one Alabama rig, one on this little single swim bait head. So that'd be my third category, the Mega Bass Spark Shad. Next up, I would throw the Dean Rojas Bronze Eye Frog. Now this is probably a surprise to some of you guys because you're like, man, Johnny, you're offshore fisherman. Why are you going with a frog? I'm telling you, Randy, I have caught more big fish on a frog behind only two baits, and that is a football jig and a deep diving crankbait. After that, it's a frog. I love fishing a frog. I've been throwing them since I was like 10 years old, and I I couldn't live without catching at least a half a dozen frog fish a year. Absolutely love it. My favorite is the red ear color and a bronze eye frog throwing it up shallow i catch them basically whenever the water temperature is about 55 degrees even right when they start spawning all the way through the fall hammer them on the frog i don't make a lot of videos about it just because you guys like watching my offshore videos I actually made a great frog video randy it got like 3,000 views um that was when i was getting like 20,000 views on normal videos so for whatever reason people don't want to watch me throw a frog but i love throwing a frog hammer them on it um in all conditions and then my final bait that I would throw, if I could pick one bait year-round, all conditions would be an original chatterbait, just a Z-Man chatterbait. Uh, I pick it up in some sort of green pumpkin color, and I would get it in uh, anywhere from a half ounce. You know, sometimes you can find the five eighths ounce in the original chatterbait. I like the five eighths ounce. I have a bunch of them. I don't think they make those anymore. But a half ounce size is good. Now I just go with a striking menace grub as the trailer, green pumpkin. I catch a ton of fish on a chatterbait too, especially if there's offshore grass in the lake, hydrilla, stuff like that. I like to throw deep diving crankbaits, football jigs, as well as chatterbaits through those areas. So didn't want to waste too much time just rolling through the baits because we want to get us all the questions tonight. But those are my top five baits. What are your thoughts on all that, Randy, before we get into your baits? There's no doubt that sort of covers the whole gamut of it. And that's the whole thing about, you know, if you've only got five baits to fish, you want to be able to have the diversity to uh, use them in a lot of different conditions. And I think that sets it up about right, man. Plus, plus they catch quality fish, you know. Yeah. You know yeah. So that's, that's the thing. I picked those baits because they produce big fish for me. And I just, I like throwing them. I know if I was fishing tournaments, those are all tournament winning baits right there. And they're also just fun baits to fish. So those are my baits there, Randy. Let's jump back over and I'm going to pull up Tack Warehouse here. You won't be able to see my screen, I know, but I have the baits pulled up. So just talk through your baits and I'll have them on the screen here. Let's go through your five baits for the rest of your life. Yeah, I think that, and this is in no particular order, but, you know, I'll start out the first one would be, uh, you know, a Zoom trick worm on a shaky head on an eighth ounce head. And this, like I said, a shaky head to me, I don't, I don't like using like much over an eighth ounce. I like to use an eighth ounce because I just like the way it falls, but a shaky head catches numbers and it catches quality fish and it works in a variety of conditions. I mean, you can catch fish on a shaky head in six inches of visibility, or you can catch it in 20 foot of visibility. It works all year long, uh, just a super, super, you know, consistent producer bass all year long. So um, shaky head is going to be, you know, definitely on my list. The color selection totally depends upon, uh, you know, the water visibility I'm fishing. I'm going to guess that probably 75% uh, of the time I'm fishing some type of a green pumpkin uh, color, whether it be green pumpkin with different type of flakes in it. Like 
green pumpkin purple, green pumpkin red, uh, just trying to match the water conditions to that bait. And then the other 25% of the time, I'm using some type of a dark color like the red bug or a June bug um, if I'm fishing a little bit dirtier water. Because a lot of times I'll fish shaky head and visibility of water two foot or less, and sometimes I like the dark one. So shaky head would definitely be at the uh, top of my list. Uh, second one would be, um, it would be a, like a three eighths ounce full size jig um, with a Zoom uh, Super Chunk Junior on it. Now this particular jig combo, this is, like I said, if you can get them to buy a full size jig, the average size on your fish is gonna go way up. So um, I love a full size jig. Um, it catches a lot of quality fish and I can fish it in a lot of different scenarios and situations. It's, 12 month out of the bait, 12 month out of the year bait. Um, I can fish it on bare rock banks. I can fish it around docks. I can fish it around bushes and, and brush, that type of stuff. So um, th that's definitely going to be at the top of my list. And the color, again, it varies upon uh, water visibility and the type of cover I'm fishing. If I can get them to bite a dark jig, I'll go with a dark jig because I think a dark jig, whether it be like a black and blue, black chartreuse, something like that. Um, it, I think it will produce bigger fish if you can get them to bite it. But I wind up fishing a lot of different more muted tones like peanut butter and jellies, uh, green pumpkins, that type of stuff most of the time because, uh, you know, it just matches the water visibility and the color of the crawfish a lot more. Um, third one, like I said, uh, it's got to be the Mega Bass Vision 110. Uh, you know, the, everybody knows that, you know, I love to fish jerk baits. Uh, it's just you know, something I like to do. It's a super versatile bait. Everybody thinks that jerk baits excel during the winter and the pre-spawn, which that's when most people fish them, but it's a 12 month out of the year bait. Um, you can catch quality fish on it all year long. It's a, in the summertime, it's a killer bait for smallmouth. I use it extensively all the time, all the way from October until April. It's one of my primary baits that I use. So um, from that standpoint, you know, it's it's definitely one of my favorites. And again, the the profile and the color on the jerk bait. without like we could go into forever in that, but the profile and the color, it depends on a couple of different combinations. It depends on the species of fish that I'm going after, what the predominant species of fish is. It depends on the water temperature and the water clarity um, as far as the choices of color that I have on there. So. Um, Mega Bass Vision 110 is definitely going to be a top one for me. Um, fourth one is probably going to be a, a walk and top water. Uh, you know, a walk and top water is a an incredible bait to catch quality fish, and it has a lot. Uh, it has a lot wider range of time frame that it's successful in than what most people think. All fish at walk and top water, like the Mega Bass Giant Dog X, um, anytime the water temperature is in the upper 50s. Um, all the way through spring, summer, fall, up until it falls back into the 50s. And, uh, you know, it excels early in the morning, late in the day, uh, certain times of the year, you can catch fish on it all year, all day long. And one of my best favorite ways to fish a walk in top water, and one of the reasons is one of my favorite baits that I that I have as one of my, you know, go-to all the time, is even when it's a slow bite on it. You can, you can throw a walk in top water and you can throw it all day long. And if you get a bite up on it, bite on it during, during the middle of the day, it's usually a good fish. So walk in top water would definitely be up there. And my last one would be a wacky rig. Um, like the Zoom Slinky, Slinko, whatever your, your favorite soft plastic stick bait is. Also wacky rig, um, like a Zoom trick worm sometimes. But I'm telling you guys right now, a wacky rig is deadly it's 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 one of the most heavily fished professional lures that pros use that don't they don't talk about it because they fish it in a lot of different scenarios around heavy cover marginal cover whatever it's a deadly bait um, it catches fish 12 months out of the year and i've been fishing it now for a decade or so and i it's just it's probably the number one bait that i have as far as if i just want to go get a bite because uh, under tough conditions, it excels. Uh, you can, you know, fish it in a variety of different water clarities, water depths. You know, you can put a little weight in it, like a Neko rig, and, you know, sink it down quicker if you want to. But wacky, wacky rig is deadly, man. But that'd be my top five right there.
That's good stuff right there, Randy. I don't know if we actually helped out uh, Keith over here with our list because we literally had zero overlap on any of our baits, which is hilarious, which just kind of goes to show how different our fishing styles are. And honestly, like, it's, it's so funny. If Randy and I switched boats... I don't think either of us could catch fish out of each other's boats because we. I would have no baits that you would want to throw. I don't think I have any of those baits like in my boat right now. Literally none of those baits are in my boat other than maybe a finesse worm. And I know you probably don't have any 6XDs. I know you have no football jigs. You may have a few swim baits. I don't know if you have any, a lot of chatter baits. So, I mean, it would be it would be interesting if we did a boat swab. That could be a kind of... Uh, an interesting video right there that just goes to show you there's so many ways to catch them i mean you get that you can't ever get locked into one technique because you know it, it's just i mean there's a lot of things that work in bass fishing you, it's just a matter of experimentation for sure and we had uh, someone comment here he said the uh, the show is over scott the show is not over we had that's one of five questions we're gonna be answering i just need to pick one question for a thumbnail because otherwise I can't say I can't make a thumbnail with seven different topics. People get confused. So we are going to, you know, keep going. But I think there's some people in the comments who say it would be fun if we switch boats for a day. So that might be something we do, Randy. One day you go on my 18 foot with a 150. My engine has 900 hours on it. You're gonna have to baby it a little bit. I got a hot foot, which I know you don't like. I got live scope. I know you don't like. It's going to be a nightmare for you. And then I'm going to be over here with this big, beautiful 21-foot boat. I'm going to drive that thing into a into a into uh, the wall because I don't know how to go that fast. So it'll be fun. Yeah, but it's going to be hard for you to get that Mega Bass Vision 110 down to 30 feet, Johnny, to get in the brush pile, <laughs> man. You've got a hard time with that. I know. I don't know if anyone's Carolina, Carolina rigged a Vision 110 before, but I'll try it. Um, good stuff. Uh, so that should be pretty fun. Okay, next question. Uh, this question uh, is coming from Instagram, and it's Anthony Holmes. His question is, what clues do you get at the boat ramp before you launch that helps you break down the lake? This is an extremely awesome question. Very happy that we got this question, so thanks, Anthony, for that. All the questions we got tonight are great. And again, if you want to ask questions that we're going to talk about on the stream, just check out our social media pages, Fish Moment Community page, Instagram, Facebook, Patreon, all kinds of stuff. So... I'll start out, Randy, and what I'm going to do is actually just pull up Google Earth. And if you could pull up Google Earth as well, Randy, while I'm kind of sharing off my screen, that way you can at least show on your screen a little bit what's going on. Um, I'm just going to pull up a lake here. And, for example, I'm going to pull up Beaver Lake. Beaver Lake is one of the most conditional fisheries that I fish on a day-to-day -day basis because – Whenever I get to the boat ramp, I have no idea where I'm going to fish, what I'm going to fish, completely, I completely uh, fly by the seat of my pants when I fish here because the fish never bite the same way twice. So this is the perfect example for this lake. As you see on the top end of the lake, you have very clean water and on the lower end of the lake, you have very dirty water. Now, not every lake is going to set up like this. This is kind of more of an extreme example, but I do want to give you guys at least a uh, clue of what I'm looking for. So whenever I get to Prairie Creek Boat Ramp over here, there are basically five things that I'm going to be looking at. First, I'm looking at the sky. I want to see whether it's going to be uh, bright bluebird skies, a cloudy day. I also want to kind of get a sense for how much wind there is. And I'll also look at the forecast, obviously, on the phone before I go out. What I find is that whenever you have a bright sunny day with less wind... It's a lot easier to catch fish on beaver in the more stained water. And that's pretty typical in a lot of lakes across the country. Whenever you get bright bluebird skies and no wind, the clear water bass get a lot tougher to catch. So I will prefer to go south on Beaver Lake into the dirtier water. And even if I'd found fish up by the dam in practice with, um, you know, or a day before with cloudy skies and wind, I'm catching a 20 pound bag, I will literally not go up to the dam because I have been burned so many times doing that on beaver. I will just scrap it and I'll just run down the dirty water, junk fish, and try to figure out what I can do. Now, other than the sky conditions, another thing I'm looking at is the water level. That's going to be key on any lake. So if we take a look at beaver, for example, there are times when this lake is drawn down a lot lower than full pool. So for example, if I get to the lake and I look at the boat ramp here and I see that there's a bunch of stuff exposed or that the boat ramp is really low or I look across the uh, 
the cove over here and I see that there's like an old road bed or something exposed on beaver, I know the lake is very, very low. And what that's usually going to do is do two things. One, it's going to congregate the fish in tighter groups. It's going to congregate them a little bit further off the bank. And then on the shoreline, it's going to congregate them around obvious cover where there's kind of a little bit more deep water. So for example, a nice um, rock transition here. Basically, there's less cover in the water, so those fish have less to relate to. So they'll go to whatever obvious cover is in the water, and they'll also group up more. So I'll probably be looking for schools of fish and trying to cover areas where I think I catch multiple fish in one area when the lakes are drawn down. However, if we're on beaver and the lake is high, we don't have a good image of this, but let's just assume the lake, sometimes the lake can be 5, 10 feet high. One year it was like 15 feet high on beaver. When the lake is up and at full pool or even up in the bushes, I know that's going to spread the fish out more. And I'm going to have to take the mentality that I'm going to be fishing for isolated fish that are just spread out among the shallow cover or up in shallower water. I'm not going to worry so much about finding schools of fish. Now, if I am going to fish for schools of fish, I'm usually going to be going to the cleanest water I can find in the deepest section of the lake. And I'm going to be fishing shallower than I normally fish. If I was fishing on Beaver Lake, for example, on normal pool in the wintertime, I might be fishing in 30 or 40 feet of water offshore. But if the lake is 5 feet high in the winter, I might be fishing in 10 or 15 feet of water because that higher water will push those offshore fish shallower, and so I can gain that just by going to the lake. Another thing I'm going to be looking for whenever I launch the boat is I want to see if I see any sort of shad activity in the area that I am in because a lot of times you can get a quick bite in the morning if you see some shad kicking or maybe you see some blueback heron uh, or not blue sorry just a blue heron uh, blue heron on the um, on the bank and you can see them chasing bird or chasing bait so if I see birds in the area that's always a great sign another thing I'm looking for is I'm going to look for how many boats are in the parking lot that is a great indicator of how difficult your fishing day is going to be. If you get to the parking lot and there is this whole parking lot is full, for example, I know that all of the best and most obvious spots are going to be absolutely covered up. And so I'm not going to worry about going and running all the obvious areas. I'm going to spend time trying to fish the more unobvious, kind of more subtle areas that other guys aren't fishing because I don't want to be fishing over the top of everyone else. Or, if I don't have the option to fish subtle areas, I'm going to pick up baits that I don't think anyone else is throwing. Pick up unique baits. So you can learn a lot just by looking at how many boats are in the parking lot. And then finally, the last thing I'm going to be looking for whenever I get to the lake is what the water visibility is in the area that I'm in if I'm familiar with the lake. This is the hardest one to do because... If you don't go to the lake regularly, it's going to be hard to tell what that water visibility is like. But, for example, if I'm on Prairie Creek and I notice that the water visibility back in here is like a foot of visibility or two foot of visibility at the boat ramp, I know that the water is really dirty and it means that there's a lot of rain that washed out these creeks. So, um, if the water is dirtier than normal or if it's clearer than normal, then that will change up my approach as well. And it will tell me, should I be fishing shallower, should I be fishing deeper, back in the creeks, there's a lot of decisions that go on, and actually, um, just while we're talking about this, I'm going to be explaining a lot of these factors in an upcoming seminar that I'm going to be doing this Thursday, which is basically going to be a seasonal bass movement seminar over on fishthemoment.com. So if you go over to fishthemoment.com, go to the virtual seminars page, it's a seasonal bass movement seminar. Now I'm going to be talking about how bass move throughout the entire year on man-made lakes with shad. And I'll explain just their general movement when conditions are normal, how high water changes that, when heavy current comes through, when there's a lot of rain, how does that affect the fish, how does that affect the shad. And I'm going to be talking about a lot of different factors, basically every factor you could think of that's going to change how bass move and how they position. And it will definitely help you find a ton more fish this year. And it's going to be the best seminar I've ever given. I've talked about it several times. I'm the most excited about this seminar more than any other seminar I've ever given. So excited for this one. I opened up a few more spots because I saw that it was full uh, at the time of the seminar. So I filled it before, opened up a few more spots. So sign them if you haven't already. And then we also have this pre-spawn tournament pattern seminar uh, for all you tournament anglers. Randy and I are going to be breaking down our best pre-spawn tournament patterns and that's coming up uh, this seasonal movement seminar is coming up this thursday and then february 18th is the pre-spawn pattern seminar so again fishmoment.com 
Don't want to spend too much time talking about that. But those are the five things I look for when I'm at the boat ramp, Randy. Um, what are your thoughts on all those? I don't know if I left any for you, but hopefully, hopefully you got a few more for me. Yeah, the, the I mean the three main ones that you picked out there that I would definitely agree with Johnny would be the uh, you know the water clarity, uh, the fishing pressure, and the sky conditions. Those are three big elements there. But I'll sort of break it down a little bit, guys, how I do it because um, you know I've I'm on throughout the last thirty or forty years. You know, I fish so many lakes in the country, and this is a question that I ask myself every time I launch the boat because I fish so many new lakes and lakes that I'm not familiar with and lakes at different times of the season. So the first thing that I do is, like I said, when, when I get to the lake, I'm, I'm sort of trying to take in everything that is there on the water that I can, that I can assimilate and add to the information that I already know going in there. Because obviously, you know, before you go to the lake, most people have done a little bit of map study on it. You're a little bit familiar with how the lake lays out and you've chosen that particular ramp that you're going to because that's probably the area you want to fish at so i'm just assuming the question that we had from our our viewer tonight is the fact that you know if you put in at the place you're going to be fishing in that general area so the first thing i do when i go down there is i'll you know park the truck get out look around a little bit i'll sort of scan the uh you know just the shoreline especially if i'm not familiar with the lake scan the shoreline and i get a mental picture in my in my mind about the water level at the time in relationship to what the normal level is on the lake so you need to have an idea in your mind on what the normal level is and when you're on the water that particular day try to determine is that lake at normal level or is it higher or is it lower that's going to give you a big big um, advantage in knowing how to approach the day because it's going to create new cover it's going to you know create different opportunities based upon the water level. So that's the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to access the water level and determine how low or high above normal that particular is. Second thing I'm going to do in there is I'm going to, you know, like I said, like Johnny said, I'm really going to pay attention to the, the weather variables. I'm going to, what direction is the wind out of, you know, what's the sky conditions, what exactly is the light intensity? What is the weather forecast for that particular day? Um, how is the wind hitting different places on the lake? Like what part of the lake is going to be the leeward side? What part of the lake is going to be the windward side in that particular area? So I'm getting this, this mental picture. And the big one here that can't be overlooked more than anything else is like what Johnny said is with water clarity. Water clarity is going to determine so much as far as how you fish, the techniques that you fish, and colors that you fish in correlation with what the water temperature is. That's another thing you need to do. As soon as you launch your boat on a place like that, immediately check the water temperature because here's the, those three important variables as you're gonna see right there at the time at the ramp. The water temperature, the water clarity, and the water level. Those three elements right there are going to give you a foundation to build your day on about how you need to approach that day with what techniques, what areas. You know, for example, if the water's a couple of feet high, is it going to you, you can look you can look at the launch ramp there and look up on the bank and see if you see many you know bushes that are up on the bank. Is it going to create a scenario where there's a flipping situation, or you know, is it if it's low, are you going to have a lot of rock transitions to fish? Is there bluffs, pea gravel, a lot of transitional rock. It's going to give you a real idea on, you know, how to approach that particular day. Next thing you want to do is I always try to turn over some rocks at the lamp, with the launch ramp and try to see if I can find some crawdads. The, the crawdad size that you can find and the coloration of the crawdad can also give you some indication on, uh, you know, what you need to do, particularly in the pre-spawn. If those fish are feeding on crawfish, so I always try to do that. I, it's not that I, I don't pay a, a lot of attention to it, but sometimes it can give me a few clues that I may not have overwise. And what Johnny said, he made a great point about the fishing pressure on there. I do not want to see a lot of boats at the ramp when I'm at. If I pull into an area and I see the ramps full, my confidence level goes way down. And just like Johnny said, one of the biggest things you can take into consideration is it's not only finding the bass, that is a challenge, but you have to find the bass that other people haven't found. That's the big challenge in fishing. It's in tournament fishing, particularly it's 
finding the bass is not the hard part. You got to find something else that nobody else has. So if you pull into a lawn tramp and it's the middle of April and you, you got to park up on the road, <coughs> excuse me, to get to the ramp, <coughs> that's an indication that you may want to spread your search area a little bit beyond, you know, the areas that are close and obvious, particularly if there's a, a major creek arm in the area that you're, that you're launching in. But, you know, every single bit of information that you can assimilate at the time you're launching is going to help you during the day. I would highly suggest also to do some, do your research before you get to the lake, because what's going to happen if you know a little bit about the lake and you know how this lake lays and you've, you've done some study on Navionics and Google Earth and you look down there and you, and you access the water clarity, the water level and the water temperature, that will give you options throughout the course of the day. If you don't get bit close there, you know, you're familiar with, enough with the lake, even if you've never seen it before, that you can run to a different part of the lake and take advantage of the of the situation that you have that particular day. So, yeah, I think Johnny covered most of it on there. I agree with the, with all those uh, points he made on there. Good deal. Yeah, and there's been a couple questions here while we were just talking about this. One is uh, from J Mavs. Do you already know if you're going deep or shallow when you get to the boat ramp? Well, for me and Randy, that's pretty simple. I know I'm going offshore. Randy knows he's fishing shallow. Randy doesn't really fish offshore very much. I don't fish shallow very much. So for us, it's easy. And that actually helps simplify our fishing because if you have to choose between both, especially if you're fishing a one-day tournament, it can be very difficult. But um, another question you had was, do these all these elements play a factor into going shallow? Yes. So honestly, there's, you know, you can get a gauge if you want to know, like I, what I would say is once you get on the lake for the first hour, you should make your con consideration of am I fishing offshore if I, or am I fishing shallow? I hardly would ever go to the lake and not know which of the two I'm going to be doing within an hour of being on the water. And there's a lot of factors that go into this and actually goes to our next question, which is actually kind of a dual question. First from Brian Rice from the Facebook community page. He asks, other than seasonal patterns, what are the top factors of choosing the best lures, techniques to use in a given day? Water clarity, wind, cloud cover, things like that. And also, um, Paul uh, uh, Gorsas, he asks, Gorsas, 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 I don't know how to pronounce that. Um, from the Facebook community page, he asks, uh, sorry, Paul, if I butchered your last name, he said, relates to the above question, is there a priority order to the factors that you need to consider when choosing a technique or a bait? For example, is water temperature more important than sun or clouds? What I will say, guys, is whenever I launch the boat, and I'm going to give you another example, I'll pull up Google Earth, there is a priority order that I make, uh, depending on where I am, of whether I'm going to fish offshore or shallow, especially if I'm on a lake where both are a player, but I'm not sure which one to go to. So for example, a great example is going to be if I'm here on Grand Lake in Oklahoma. If I'm on Grand Lake here and I launched a boat and I'm most of the time I'm trying to go catch them offshore. So I've, uh, I've already planned out. I know what the water clarity is going to be like. I talk to people. I kind of know what's going on in general on the lakes. Um, I don't really ever get spots because no one wants to give me their spots because they know I'm going to share them. But uh, I don't share any spots people give me um, on my YouTube videos. So I, I'm not one of those guys. But uh, um, anyway, so what um, what I will do is if I get to, for example, the Disney boat ramp here, and I'm on the lower end of Grand Lake down by the dam, and I see that the water visibility is less than two foot of visibility down by the dam section here on Grand Lake, that is a red flag for me for offshore fishing because usually this is the clearest section of the lake. And so if I get down to the clear section of the lake and I have a foot and a half of visibility, pretty much my mind is telling me offshore fishing is not going to be an option. I find that the best offshore bite where I can actually go out and catch a good bag is when the water visibility is two plus feet of visibility at least on the clearest section of the lake. Now, if I launched over here in Snake uh, Snake Island area, Horse Creek, usually the water visibility here is around anywhere from two and a half to four feet of visibility. Well, if I get here and the water visibility is six inches of visibility, I'm not going to feel too great about fishing offshore. Same thing if I'm over here by... Um, Wolf Creek area. Usually this has a foot and a half to two foot of visibility. You can still catch them offshore when that water visibility is at its clearest point in the dirty water. So if you get to horse or to uh, the, the Wolf Creek here and 
the normal water visibility is a foot and a half, but it's actually two feet of visibility, that tells me there's a good chance that I can find some offshore fish. However, if I get here and the water visibility is a foot or six inches, usually that means the better option is to fish up shallow, and I need to run down the lake or change boat ramps even to find the clear water and run down here towards the dam. So water visibility for offshore fishing for me is probably the number one consideration I make on whether I'm going to fish offshore or not. Now, the difference between two foot of visibility and four foot of visibility, that doesn't bother me that much. That's just going to dictate how deep I need to be fishing, but it doesn't necessarily dictate if I'm gonna fish offshore or fish up shallow. The other factor I'm always paying attention to when I get to the lake is whether it's windy and cloudy or bright bluebird skies and sunny. On days when it's windy or cloudy, it's going to spread the fish out a lot more and make them a little bit more likely to roam. What this means offshore is that I'm not going to expect to find fish grouped up tight to cover like a brush pile or a rock pile. So I'm not going to be going off these points and finding a bunch of fish grouped up really tight on brush. Instead, they might be spread out more on a long gradual point and I might catch them on a deep diving crankbait or a swim bait. And I'm going to have to change up my bait selection to fish baits that are more moving style baits when it's windy, cloudy. But on days when it's bright, sunny, bluebird skies... Usually that means those fish are not going to be roaming as much. They're going to be tight to cover like brush piles, rock piles. And I'll be able to go off of some points or some coves, find a brush pile, and then fish it really thoroughly. And I will pick my techniques based on the conditions. So for me, there's so many factors that go into it. But honestly, the two most important factors for me, more than anything, water visibility. And the second is going to be your um, weather conditions, cloudy, sunny, or if it's windy, things like that. Now, presence of bait fish, type of lake you're on, seasonal patterns. I mean, there's a million factors that dictate this. And again, that's what that seasonal bass seminar is going to be on, is explaining where you actually need to go to find fish. So when you get to the lake, you can find them really fast. So again, that's that seasonal bass seminar, fishmoment.com. Check that out. and It'll be showing you where to actually go, like which sections of the creek to go to. And that's one thing that, you know, I can say pretty confidently is, and here's the seminar for those, it's this... Um, fishmoment.com virtual seminars for those of you who didn't see it a second ago. So um, the thing that I would say is that in general, I know exactly where I need to go when I launch the boat in general because I understand seasonal bass movement, seasonal behavior, as well as looking at the water. I can tell you, hey, there's going to be a good main lake bite today or there's going to be a good bite in the back of the creeks or they're going to be halfway back in the creeks. I can pretty much make that determination within two hours of being on the lake, an hour and a half of being on the lake. And I can also pretty quickly determine if I can catch fish offshore or not really quickly as well. So that's kind of my thoughts on that question, Randy. What are your thoughts in terms of, you know, wanting to fish up shallow or what your techniques of shallow are going to be based on the weather and kind of a priority order of what factors you would want to consider? Yeah, the you know, I think one of the, the, the biggest questions I've got in my whole career about bass fishing is like the, a lot of people say, well, how do you go to a lake that you've never seen and catch bass before? And I tell them, you know, that there's I really there's only three things I need to know. If, if you can you can put me on you could blindfold me and put me on any lake in the country that I've never seen before. And if you just tell me when I get there, what's the water visibility? What's the water temperature? what's the water level as compared to its norm and what the sky conditions are, I can pretty much tell you how I need to fish and what I, where I need to be fishing at. Those are the four most important elements that you need to understand and get a grasp of uh, regardless where you're fishing in the country. And on top of that, a lot of it has to center around what the type of the, the predominant species of the fish that you're fishing in the lake that you live on. Um, you know, it, whether, you know, like here in my part of the country, we have the, and we're Johnny and I fish, we have the mixed species. We have the largemouth spotted bass and smallmouth in, you know, pretty, pretty uh, equal, not equal, but, you know, fairly equal amounts compared to the rest of the country. If you're fishing down in the southeast, you may have strictly largemouth. If you're fishing up north, predominant smallmouth. So a lot of it depends on that. But so that's the four, the things I'm looking for. When I get there, it's like, the number one thing I want to know is, is time of the year and water temperature because water temperature is relative to the season because when you have 50 degree water, the bass are going to react different in 50 degree water in March than they would in 50 degree water in November. 
Um, they're just positioned different. Their moods are different. The, the, the cycle of the year is different. So I want to know, you know, it depends totally on the season that you're fishing. But that water temperature is going to give me, um, you know, a good indication of some different things I need to fish in. But I need to know the water clarity with that water temperature. Because if I know the water clarity with that, temp that water temperature, that immediately narrows down my techniques and my options um, that I have available to me. Or, so, or, or it's really going to, it's going to allow me to capitalize on what the, the best techniques are under those set of conditions. Doesn't matter if I'm fishing offshore or on the bank, because, you know, if I'm fishing a, a, a grass lake, I fish offshore all the time. I mean, I, I don't go, I don't graph around like Johnny does for hard structure on impoundments, but if I'm fishing a TV lake, TVA lake, the Texas Lake, Florida Lake, I'm off the bank because that's where the predominant cover's at. So, uh, you know, but what's going to happen is if I know that water temperature and that water clarity, that's going to give me an idea of what I need to, to use technique wise. Um, is it going to be a reaction bait? It's going to be a, you know, a, a slow bait. It's going to give me a big indicator there. The water level on the lake in combination with the water clarity and the water temperature is going to give me a big indicator of specifically what part of the lake I need to be in. Because say, for example, if we're fishing um, Table Rock Lake in April and the water's five feet over normal, I'm going to be, you know, water temperature is going to be 60 degrees. There's going to be a little bit off colored, you know, tint to the water. It's going to be a lot of bushes in the water. Immediately that note, I know I'm going to go to the bushes. I'm going to pull out the flipping stick, maybe tie on a spinner bait, and I'm going to flip those bushes under that set of conditions. Consequently, if I get to the lake and it's like the conditions are stable, the water's low, the water's really clear, uh, it's a bright sunny day, then I know I'm going to have to maybe go into more finesse techniques. I can prepare my day with, you know, shaky heads, Ned rigs, drop shots, wacky rigs, that type of stuff. Um, so, you know, all this information you can assimilate before you get to the lake to help narrow your search down. But, and then the sky conditions, uh, the sky conditions are going to, they're going to, they're going to totally determine the personality and mood of the fish that particular day particularly if you're on a lake that has, you know, water visibility of over three feet. Anytime you've got water visibility of over three feet and it actually even gets more, more intense, the clearer the water goes, the sky conditions are extremely important. Here's a, here's a prime example. Yesterday I was at Table Rock Lake. We were doing a fish the moment on the water lesson. And when we got there in the morning, um, it was cloudy. Uh, you know, the wind was blowing pretty good and, uh, you know, the fish were biting, you know, jerk baits fairly good under those conditions. Water visibility was like eight to 10 foot clarity. So under those conditions, uh, you know, they bit under those conditions. About 12 o'clock, the wind died down a little bit. The sun came up, fish got a little bit tougher. You know, fishing got a little bit tougher because, you know, the clarity's changed, the light intensity changed. And then in the afternoon, the wind picked up, even though it was bright and sunny, the wind still picked up, but it created a different um, uh, light intensity penetration for the fish and the fish started biting again. So it's, it's constantly changing. The weather causes the bass to constantly change and, you know, you, you have to adapt with those conditions. But basically here, here's my foundation for that. It's, it's when, you know, when you get down there, pay attention to the water temperature, water clarity, water level and sky conditions. And that's going to point you in the right direction with the right technique uh, quicker than anything. Awesome. That's good stuff. Um, really good stuff. So uh, one thing that I wanted to call out, there's a couple of people in the comments just kind of ask questions. A lot of questions about baits and um, seasons, timing, all that stuff. It's hard to get into all that stuff because everything's so specific to different lakes. But one thing I'm going to be doing, Randy, here, and I want to share is just a little sneak peek. I've been working on a little data project again. You know I like my data analytics, pulling data. Last two days, or last couple of days, on uh, other than today. So basically, um, Sunday, Monday, I spent all day working on this monstrosity that I'm about to show on the screen. This is every single Bassmaster Tour event data. There's like a 400 lines of this. 91 tournaments. I've collected every single top three finish, the bait they were using, the cover, structure, things like that. And I've been able to actually determine 
what are the top eights for every top three finish based on lake type, state, primary species, season, all this stuff. And I'm making a video about this. And I'm actually going to make this data available to you guys. So check out the video on fishthemoment.com or Fish the Moment YouTube page on Thursday if you want me to go through all this data. I have a ton of other data in here cut different ways, but really cool stuff going to be on the Fish the Moment YouTube channel. So if you haven't actually seen the main Fish the Moment channel, head over on YouTube, just have in Fish the Moment. We have 80, close to 86,000 subscribers now on Fish the Moment. Subscribe over there. I see only like 30% of my viewers are subscribed. So subscribe there and also subscribe to this Fish the Moment live channel. If this is the first time here, check out, again, the main channel. Check out Randy's channel as well on Two of Angling with Randy Blockett. And also just leave a like down in the video. If you like all these tips, Leaving a like on this live stream helps share it out. It really, really helps. So um, that's going to be a video I'm going to be doing. It took me a lot of time putting that together, Randy. I basically went through Bassmaster website, watched all the TV shows. One thing that's funny, though, is that I was able to actually, for like probably two-thirds of the tournament, I was able to go just from the results page and tell you what all top three guys were doing with their areas, their baits, all that stuff. Because I've watched all these Bassmaster shows so many times. I knew the information without even watching the TV show. I just knew it off the top of my head. That's how much of a bass nerd I am. I've watched everything yeah. so much. I just know it already. So that, that was kind of cool. Poor man. It is. <laughs> um, <laughs> so pretty good stuff. Um, so anyways... Let's uh, let's get to our next question. Next question is going to be from Stephen Becht um, on Patreon. If you guys don't know what Patreon is, it's a way you can actually support uh, Fish the Moment, me and Randy, um, basically giving us a monthly donation. So if you want to go check out patreon.com backslash fish the moment, and uh, we put the questions there as well. So this question is from Stephen on Patreon. Uh, he asks, I would love to hear you both talk about the difference between largemouth, spotted bass, and smallmouth bass um, in any season and how you know when to specifically fish for each species during tournaments. I thought that was an awesome question because I think that there's a lot of confusion around which species to target in tournaments, things like that, especially if you have lakes like a Table Rock Lake where you have all three species. Now, to start it out, easiest thing to say is, if you're fishing up north in a great lake or a lake where you know that there's always going to be four and five pound smallmouth, that's the way to win. So if you're fishing on Lake Erie, Lake Michigan, Lake St. Clair, it's not a great lake, but it's close to that area. If you know that you have big smallmouth like that, those tournaments are going to get one with smallmouth. Um, the St. Lawrence River, stuff like that. I would just go for smallmouth. That's like the predominant species that works. Same thing on a lake like uh, Lake Dardanelle, Arkansas River. That's going to be a largemouth tournament. There's no smallmouth in there, and that's just largemouth city. So if you're in a shallow, dirty lake, you're going to be fishing for largemouth. Um, and you can just look at tournament results and see what type of fish the guys are ha- holding up. What we're, I want to kind of get into, though, is when to know to fish for largemouth, spotted bass, or smallmouth on lakes that maybe have a mix of all three, like a Table Rock or a Cherokee Lake or a Dale Hollow Lake over in Tennessee, uh, maybe a Bull Shoals Lake, stuff like that. And honestly, Randy, for my my opinion is that if you can catch largemouth bass on lakes that have predominant or have a mix of all three species in general, largemouth are going to win most tournaments, especially if you can get on a three to four pound average largemouth bite. If you can find the largemouth, that's the way to win. The only time that's not really the case is when, for whatever reason, the largemouth bite gets a little bit tough and you have good three to four pound smallmouth in your lake and there's really a small window where those smallmouth can play i find that on a lot of lakes around the country the smallmouth play in two times of the year they play post spawn right after the bass spawn um, because they'll group up really tight like in late april early may maybe into early june on like a table rock or a lake that's you know highland reservoir with smallmouth that will play really well with uh, the other time it will play really well is in the fall. There's certain times in the fall when the smallmouth will pull up and you can catch big bags of smallmouth in like October. Um, but it seems like that's really the only two windows I find where the smallmouth play enough to work. Now you can catch a 15 pound, 18 pound bag of smallmouth a lot of times in tournaments and do pretty well. But on those same times, like in the pre-spawn, for example, in March, you can also catch a 25 pound bag of largemouth. So you can't really compete with the smallmouth. Same thing goes with the spotted bass. In general, if there's a good largemouth bite on a spotted bass fishery, their largemouth are going to win 
95 percent of the time the only exceptions that might be like a lake lanier in georgia where you have big magnum four pound spots or like a lake um hartwell at certain times of the year the spotted bass can play but in general what i would say is that if you wanted to pick one versus the other go for largemouth day in day out the only time I would go for the alternate species is when the largemouth bite is really tough and you're struggling to catch a largemouth bass. That's usually going to be in the fall or usually going to be in that post-spawn period. That's when I go for those spotted bass or the smallmouth. What are your thoughts there, Randy? Man, you know why that's a, such a good question is the fact that I, this is a question that pros ask themselves all the time on certain lakes and tournaments because, you know, do I do I want to go to the win the tournament or do I want to go for – you know, to get a, a quick limit of spotted bass and then go for a largemouth. Um, there's, this is, the, that's why this is such a great question. But a lot of this depends on a couple different things. It, just like Johnny touched on a lot of them, it depends on the lake that you're fishing. It depends on the time of the year. And for example, let me use a couple different scenarios here. Let's look at Lake Champlain in Vermont. Um, lake Champlain is one of those lakes that you can win on smallmouth or on largemouth. But normally, largemouth will wind up winning that tournament because they're bigger depending upon the time of the year for example at champlain like if you go there like in in june most all the time the water the lakes the tournament's going to get one on largemouth but if you go back there in september the smallmouth becomes such a bigger factor because they're a lot fatter and heavier by september although largemouth can still win so you have to make a determination in your mind um, do you want to go for like the, 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 the high risk, high reward species of a fish? Like, for example, I consider largemouth a high risk, high reward species at Lake Champlain because the smallmouth are so abundant and easy to catch. Um, so that's a, just a, a judgment call based upon uh, what you want to accomplish in the tournament. The second one is like, you know, like I said, I can't reiterate how important time of the year is in this because I remember I fished a tournament at Lake Seminole in Georgia. It was a Bassmaster Top 150 tournament. And normally, like if you fish Lake Seminole, like in the pre-spawn or any other time of the year, um, largemouth would dominate that tournament. You couldn't win on anything but largemouth. But uh, Seminole has a population of swan, of, of, of the swanee bass. Of the swan, the, no, I'm sorry, sorry, the shoal bass. And in that particular tournament, it was a fall tournament, uh, like an October-November tournament. I couldn't get anything going down the lake. So I decided the last day of practice to run as far as I could up the Chattahoochee River in my bass boat through these rapid rocks. It was nasty, like crazy. And I got up there and I started catching these shoal bass and I almost won the tournament. I finished like, I don't know, fourth or fifth in the tournament and had the fish on to win it. But those fish would not have played at any other time of the year except in the fall when it was tough. So the t determination you have to make is, um, you know, do you want to catch limits? Do you want to have a chance to win the tournament? That's going to be a big determination. And just like Johnny said, the the density of each species is going to make that question a lot easier for you. If you have a lake um, that like Table Rock Lake, Bull Shoals, these Ozark lakes, or even some of the lakes in Georgia that have a good mix of spotted bass and largemouth, um, sometimes you have to focus on a mixed bag. Sometimes you can't special, you can't specifically say, I'm going to go target largemouth or smallmouth. Like, for example, if you're fishing Lake, Lake Lanier, you could run way up the Chattahoochee River and you could flip laydowns and you could crank ch channel banks up the Chattahoochee River, but you may get 25% of your fish will still be spotted bass even up that river. So, um, but your odds of catching a largemouth are a little bit better versus if you go down the lake at Lake Lanier, um, if you catch 20 fish, you may have one or two of them be a largemouth and the rest are spotted bass. So certain parts of the lake are going to have larger densities of specific species. But I think I think probably the best um, answer to that question is that you have to ask yourself, what are your expectations in the tournament? Are you, are you in that tournament to win the tournament? Are you trying to qualify for a championship? Do you just want to be consistent? And if you basically based upon what those are that that can really determine what species you need to target uh, that particular day so but great question like i said every pro asks themselves that question it's a dilemma because 
you know, we all want to go for the big ones. You know, we, if, if there's a, if there's a big largemouth bite going up the river that on a lake that's full of spotted bass, you know, you, you, you have this mental battle within your mind. You, you know, do I need to go up there and spend some time fishing for those largemouth or do I just need to focus and grind out a good limb of spots every day? Or if you're fishing a lake like Lake Cumberland, you say, man, do I go down the lake and try to catch those big smallmouth or do I run in the back of the creeks and try to catch some big largemouth? So it's a, it's a, it's a dilemma for everybody. And um, just answer to your question is just whatever your you decide what your expectations are in the tournament. Let that be your guide. Yeah, I know it's not the perfect answer. It's, it's just it's so dependent on the time of year conditions. It's it's very very specific. So it's not an easy question to answer. But hopefully that kind of gave you a general sense. Uh, so, but thanks for the question. So uh, we got one more question left. It's actually gonna be a really good one. So I uh, want to get into that. I'm actually really excited about this one. But one thing I wanted to call out again, guys, I need to do some shameless plugs. We don't have any sponsors for the podcast or the live stream. A lot of live streams have like half the viewership that we do, and they have like 20 sponsors. We just have our website. So if you guys like the content of Fish the, uh, Fish the Moment, head over to fishmoment.com and two, or there's really three easy ways to support the channel. First, sign up for some of our upcoming virtual seminars. Talked about these earlier. The Seasonal Bass Movement Seminar is going to be an awesome one to help you understand how all the different factors affect bass movement throughout the year. And there's going to be, I think I opened up about 15 more spots just in case anyone else wanted to sign up. We were filled up before the seminar, but that's up this Thursday. And then we have our pre-spawn pattern seminar. So if you like this live stream and you like the Fish Moment videos, we're going to be giving you guys tons of graphics. We're going to be spilling all the juice. Randy doesn't give up everything in his videos and stuff like that, but I make him spill everything in these seminars. So you guys get the juice of the juice um, in these seminars. And another thing, we have our, our Fish Moment Lake Breakdown. So if you guys are interested in just getting some spots to fish this spring and you're struggling a little bit, uh, basically you can get 40 GPS waypoints so you can transfer straight to your fish finder. And Randy's been knocking out these sp spring map breakdowns. We have, I think, 26 already up on the website. So if you're planning for your spring trips, you got lakes here from all across the United States, and we're adding more and more every week. You can also sign up for a personal lake breakdown with Randy if you want to sign up there. Um, and he can break down any lake, even if it's not in our list here with those 40 waypoints. And the last thing is if you guys really like the content, but you don't have maybe the means to support us um, financially from like seminar, stuff like that, just head over to the Support Fish Moment page and use our Tackle Warehouse affiliate link. All you do is just literally click the link, go check on Tackle Warehouse, and everyone's buying baits. So you have, I know you might have money for a seminar, but you have money to buy, you know, $50 worth of jigs. I know you guys, I'm, I'm telling you. So just use this link. You can just actually bookmark this link if you want to for the future. And if you use that link, just go to this web, go to our website, click the link. It'll take you straight to Tackle Warehouse. Check out on the website. We get a small percentage of your, of your sale, helps us out, and it's a really easy way to support the channel. So Enough of that. Um, that's in lieu of our sponsor talk. So let's jump to the last question here, Randy. And our last question for the stream tonight is from BR Bass Media from Instagram. He asks, when do I know if I'm ready to fish the BFLs? The BFLs, for those who don't know, it's the Bass Fishing League. It's kind of like the uh, step below the semi-pro. So basically, you have like local buddy tournaments. You maybe have the Bass Federation tournaments. You have BFLs, which is like a $200 entry fee you throw in. You fish against a lot of good anglers. Then you have like the Toyota Series, which is like a $1,000 or $2,000 entry fee. You have the Bassmaster Opens as well in that same level. And then you have the Elite Series. So that's kind of the leveling of tournaments. So the Bass Fishing League, the BFLs, kind of like the third level. Um, kind of like double A, kind of. It was, you kind of say it's what, it, what it's like. So it's like double yeah. A for bass fishing. So obviously, uh, I have some input here. But I want to start with you, Randy, because you have a lot more experience tournament fishing than I do. When do you think someone is actually ready to throw their hat into the BFLs? Well, I think, you know, the BFLs are, you know, they are very competitive. I mean, if you, when you're thinking about BFLs, don't think that this is just a bunch of amateur weekend dudes out fishing. You've got some hammers fishing BFL. You've got guys fishing BFLs that could fish on the Elite Series easy and, and make a living on it. So just because they're not fishing professionally doesn't mean they're not really good. The first thing that you have to do on that, as I'd say, is you you got to you can you got to be confident in yourself, and you can't fake confidence. You can't fake your way into thinking you're going to do good in tournaments. That confidence comes 
from maybe having some success at team tournaments, buddy tournaments, club tournaments, uh, or just going fishing on your own and just being successful a lot. And I'll sort of tell you how I did it because I fish. I, that's how I started out. I, I was fishing. I started fishing the red man's, which are now the BFLs. Uh, you know, it's, they, they, that's what they used to be called as the red man's, but now they're BFLs in 1984. And, um, prior to that, I'd been fishing. Uh, there were just some, you know, team tournament, local stuff, club tournaments, there was a tournament organization called the great plains pro bass association i fished and i was doing okay in that type of stuff and a friend of mine just got me talked into fishing the red man's or the bfls he said man you need to come down to bull shoals and fish that first tournament um you know you know let's go do it so i just took the leap of faith and you know went out and did it first first year i was able to qualify for the regional made me made the all-american my first year it wasn't because of my skill level. I just got lucky on a lot of different aspects. But the point was, is um, I was confident enough in my abilities to make that level based upon some stuff that I'd fished before. So um, I don't think there's anything wrong with doing that. If you have any doubt of your skill levels, go for a, a season or two on the co-angler side. Because if you go on the co-angler side, you're getting a front seat, uh, you know, picture of how these guys are breaking down the water. They're not holding anything back. They're showing you all the juice. You can see how they run their water. It's a tremendous learning experience. You can learn so much by being in the water with somebody. Um, and if you're not real confident of getting in the front of that boat yet, but ultimately you'll know, I mean, you'll know if you, when you get out there and you don't feel intimidated by everybody else, you, you, you feel confident that you can go out and locate and find fish. Um, and just be honest with yourself. Don't, don't, don't try to, you know, don't, when you, when you act or when you just sort of analyze your skill level where it's at at the time, you know, just be brutally honest with yourself, how, how um, talented or good you think you are at the time. None of us ever are great. I mean, we, every single person out there is in a constant learning phase. I mean, I don't care who it is. I mean, you can take John Cox, you can take, you know, Aaron Martin's Van Dam, they're still learning too. They don't have all the answers. None of us do. So, uh, you know, and another thing, if you love it, I mean, if you just love it, you love competition, don't worry about doing good. Just get out there and just, you know, just fish, let it flow, let it come to you. And, uh, you know, you'll never know unless you get out there and try it. For sure. And honestly, like I, I fished BFLs as a co-angler. I never actually fished any BFLs. I actually signed up for all the BFLs this year and then they all got moved back and then scheduling. I just pulled out of the BFLs. So I'm going to potentially do that here in um, next year, the year after. But, um, you know, the thing about going out and fishing any tournament, but the BFLs especially, is that on the BFL level, you're fishing against all of the best anglers who have fished these lakes for years and years and years. So it's not like you're going out and just fishing against some random guys. Like, these are the best sticks on each lake who know the lake better than everyone. So even if Kevin Van Dam, Jacob Wheeler, uh, Jordan Lee, all these guys launched the boat in that BFL and they had three days of practice, there's a chance that they still would not crack the top five or the top ten in these BFLs because all the guys on these lakes, they know the water so much better. And there's a difference between guys who are good on one lake or maybe three lakes versus guys who can go around the country and catch fish. It's a completely different skill set. And you could take a guy who's the BFL, BFL Angler of the Year on his home three lakes every year and I've seen this happen. There's guys in my local area that are re they're really good sticks. They win almost everything in this area. They then go and try to fish at the next level, and they wash out. They don't hardly ever do anything, or they, can, they can't find fish on lakes that they don't fish 100 days a year. So you have to take that into consideration and set your expectations properly that you might not go out to win every BFL. But the other thing you have to think about is if you're going to go fish the BFLs and you want to be competitive, you have to have an expertise in some technique. What I find is that if you're a jack of all trades and you're just kind of a little bit good at spinnerbait, maybe you can catch them on a jig and you have like a bunch of different, like you're average at a lot of different stuff. Unless you get really lucky, you're not going to be successful in the BFLs or really any tournament series. 
the way you can be consistently good is having an expertise in two or three in through two or three techniques and sticking with them. So for example, in my case, I'm really good at throwing deep diving crankbait, really good at throwing a football jig, I'm really good at throwing a swim bait. If the fish are offshore, anywhere on the lake, I can go catch them pretty well. Now, unfortunately, all the BFLs in my area are like on Grand Lake in March. So that's not going to be a technique that works on Grand Lake in March very well. So I'm going to get my butt kicked. So what that means is I'm going to have to, if I was going to go fish BFLs, which I'm actually going to make a video series about this, I need to develop a new skill, like learn how to throw a spinner bait up in shallow water or flipping a jig under boat docks on shallow dirty water, something like that, that I have, I'm extremely confident and I know when it goes from being sunny to being cloudy, how do I make the adjustments? Do I go to a bigger blade on the spinner bait, reel it faster or slower? I don't know any of that. I know exactly how to do that in a football jig. I know exactly how to do that with a deep dive crankbait. But the BFLs aren't fished in the summertime when I can win tournaments with a football jig with a deep dive crankbait. So that's another consideration to take into account. If you have a skill set, it needs to match up with the tournament schedule and you need to have that you can fall back on. Because what you'll find is that during a tournament in a BFL, you have money on the line and it's very easy to spin out really fast. If you're not confident in exactly what you're doing and you don't have confidence in the bait you're throwing or the technique you're doing, you can spin out in a, in a second in those tournaments. And so having not even just being able to know you're good in tournaments, but knowing you're good at a technique and know how to adjust to that technique is crucial to any tournament success, at least in my opinion. Um, Obviously, once you go to the pro level, it's a completely different thing. You need to be good at a lot of different techniques. But in general, for the local level, figure out what the top techniques are on your lakes in the seasons that the BFLs are fished. They're usually fished on the same lakes in the same time of year every year. Learn the one or two techniques really well in those areas, like throwing a spinnerbait on Grand Lake in March. That's a skill I need to learn if I'm going to go fish BFLs, and that's going to make you a lot better. Would you agree with that, Randy? Yeah, and here's one story that may give you some confidence on your question there. I remember reading a interview with Roland Martin. Um, Roland went, the, the first or second Bassmaster tournament he went to back in the late 1960s, he, he was going to the weigh-in and he saw these guys bringing in these huge strings of bass. He said, he goes, I can't do that. He said, I'll never be able to compete out here. And, and he almost quit. He almost said, I'm just out of my league. I'm never going to make it. And of course he went on to like, you know, having the most incredible record in the 1970s as any professional angler has. So, um, you know, like I said, don't, don't, if, if you, if that's something that you want to do and you're passionate about it and, uh, you know, that's your dream to do, I mean, just, just go for it, man. Definitely. Yeah. And we're going to be making videos about that guys coming up here. Uh, I'm going to be doing a series actually with all that data I picked up. I haven't even told you about this, Randy, but I want to do a series. Let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. I want to start fishing some tournaments in, uh, some BFLs and stuff like that in this area and if i was fishing bfls down like central arkansas i would go do it in a heartbeat because i know all those lakes pretty well and i know how to go catch them there but in oklahoma and in this area actually uh, i'll talk about this in the video on thursday but i filtered the data a little bit randy and i figured out that only 30 percent of the top finishes on lakes in oklahoma and arkansas and missouri kind of like where we fish are one or like have high finishes offshore six i think it was 65 percent or 70 percent of the high finishes came up shallow so basically when i go to the tournaments i need to be able to fish shallow otherwise i'm going to be struggling so i'm actually going to have randy go out in the boat i'm gonna go out in his boat watch him he's gonna teach me how to do this hopefully and i'm gonna go out in the water and show you how i learn new techniques up shallow i think that'll be a good series and then maybe we can do vice versa too randy uh i can show you some offshore stuff and once randy gets a live scope or something like that we can uh we can do the vice versa on that i think that'd be a fun series as well so we got a lot of cool content coming up for you guys uh always feel free to leave a comment on our videos also send us messages on our social media platforms and if you enjoyed this live stream this week, which I think people did, um, we're going to be posting another set of questions or another question on our all of our pages, Facebook community page, Facebook page, Instagram, Patreon, asking for more questions for the next live stream. So definitely check out those pages so you can get your question answered. And I'm just going to keep a running list. So even if your question is really good and we don't pick it for next week, we'll still keep the list running and it'll get picked at some point. So, um, you know, that's going to be the, go the plan going forward for future live streams. 
And if you haven't subscribed to the Fish the Moment Live channel, the channel you're watching right now, and you like the content here, go subscribe. It allows you to get notified of our upcoming streams. And if you don't want to get a reminder, we just just know we're here 7 p.m. every single Tuesday, 7 p.m. Central Standard Time every Tuesday um, on Fish the Moment Live channel. And then we have videos on the Fish the Moment channel Thursday at 7 a.m. every single Thursday. Um, so subscribe to all the channels and leave a like on the stream if you enjoy. Um, so Randy, that's about it. Any other last comments uh, on all the questions we had today? Yeah, well, I'd just like to say one thing. I got, we got, I'm reading through the comments here. We got a comment from John that says that right now there's three times more people watching this, this Fish the Moment podcast than there are Bass University right now. Guys, we appreciate that. I mean, for us to be able to, you know, have that type of participation and that you guys are passionate enough and, and, and willing to take your time out of your evening to, to watch us on those podcasts, that I just am just humbled by that. So thank you very much uh, to put us on that level. Much appreciated. Yeah, for sure. We really appreciate it, guys. And we try to just give up as much information as we can and be as helpful as possible. I know that that's something that is kind of missing in the fishing industry. There's a lot of guys who try to hold back information and stuff like that. And that's not what we're here for. That's the reason I really don't fish that many tournaments, guys. The reason I would fish tournaments is is literally just to make content for you guys to show you how I would fish a tournament. But the thing about fishing tournaments is once I go fish out there one time, I'm going to give up all my spots because that's how I do it. So it's kind of pointless for me to fish a lot of tournaments. And I know Randy, uh, he still has tournaments to go. Um, so he shares a ton of information um, and tries to give up as much as he can. And, you know, we're giving up as many as much information as we possibly can to help you guys out. So hopefully... You're learning from the channel, learning from the live streams, everything like that. And, um, you know, we just really appreciate the support, appreciate everything that you guys do for us, Lost, to make a living doing this. It's kind of crazy still thinking back, you know, um, 10 years ago, I never imagined I could make a living in the fishing industry without being a professional fisherman. And the fact that I can is a big blessing. And I'm really uh, just grateful for you guys for that. And, uh, you know, just thanks for everything. Anything else, Randy? That's it. Thanks a lot, guys. And we'll see you all next week, man. Yeah, see you next week, 7 p.m. Central Standard Time, Tuesday, same time, same place. We'll see you guys next week. Have a great night.